All right. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and uh, you are participating in the February 2023 webinar. We're joined by Dr. Dave McGill from West Virginia University. Um, I've known Dave for a lot of years. We we usually come together at least once a year with the Northeast Extension Foresters. And uh, one time I hit up Dave for a webinar. Dave's been on the webinar series of several times and he offered to do a webinar on tree ID. And I thought, oh, okay, well, you know, most foresters have a tree ID talk. Dave gave the best tree identification <laughs> webinar. So I was just like, so I use that now whenever we're doing online learning, I always have people watch Dave's tree identification. So if you're looking for some way to spend an engaging hour or so, go to the YouTube slash Forest Connect channel and check out Dave's tree ID talk. But today, <laughs> Dave is gonna be talking about a briefing on oak regeneration ecology. This is a hot topic for a lot of people. Oak is a very important species and is um, uh, worth learning more about and particularly how to regenerate it. So Dave, with that, I'm going to mute my microphone and turn it over to you. Thanks very much for joining us. Th thank you, Peter. It's always it's always great to be on this uh, seminar series of yours. It's uh, like I've said in the past, uh, I always get a little nervous because it's uh, one of the first ones that uh, ever started up. And, and so I appreciate the opportunity. Yes. So Peter asked me to to do another talk, and I was uh, racking my brain for what I could talk about, and uh, so uh, I uh, was once asked to do a, a talk for a, a for stewardship program a field exercise on oak biology, which is pretty general, so I thought, oh, you know, open slate, I'll maybe create something, so I put together these slides, and I've added to it um, over time, and um, and this is not going to be a talk about how to regenerate oak. It's mostly a talk about, you know, to uh, give a, a a picture or a vision or an image of how some of the complexities of oak regeneration, and and hopefully to develop a little bit of an appreciation, uh, uh, an enhanced appreciation for for this um, kind of process that oaks go through to to regenerate themselves. So so the way I've um, uh, let's see if I can click this. Uh, so the way I've um, structured this, I have a brief description of the oaks. Most people are familiar with the oaks. Um, talk a little bit about reproductive biology, you know, the birds and the bees of oak trees, and then uh, integrate some of the uh, biological, the biotic and abiotic factors that affect this process of regeneration um, at the end there. So, so here we go. So uh, description of the oaks, uh, most of you are familiar with this, the, the name, the genus of this group or taxon of plants is, is Quercus. And so uh, comes from the Latin. So if you were with your Latin, uh, uh, you know, uh, lover walking along the road back in Roman times, you might say, hey, let's go sit under the, the Quercus, you know, the oak tree just uh, so there's about 500 species of these things uh, worldwide, and they're primarily distinguished by um, their male flowers being in catkins, these long pendulous little strings of flowers that we'll see in a second here. And then its fruit is an acorn uh, that basically consists of a little cap and a nut. Uh, they're distributed uh, across the North America mostly. They're pretty much of a te temperate uh, taxon or group of plants. And in North America, they exist most places in the United States, except the Great Plains and kind of this inland empire. Um, but uh, they extend all the way down into Central America and parts of South America as well. So they're mostly a temperate uh, plant group, uh, but they do get down in the tropics a bit. Uh, this is a diagram of a paper that was uh, published recently about the taxonomy of the genus Quercus. And I've actually blanked out some of these things to make it simpler. And we're going to be just talking about the red oaks and the white oaks. Uh, uh, they've gone through some re fairly recent name changes and they'll continue to do so. You know, we adapt to our taxonomists. But uh, uh, the, the white oaks in the section Quercus and the red oaks in the Lobati. And so you can see this purplish cover representing that red oak group. It's mostly in the Western hemisphere. Uh, the blue line surrounds this section Quercus or the white oaks, and that's pretty much distributed worldwide. 
a little bit deeper into this, the red oaks, uh, formerly called Eurythrobalanus, it's a synonym for this new section name called Lobati. Uh, this is, these are the these are the oaks that uh, are characterized by the little pins at the end of their veins that stick beyond the margin of the leaf. The veins actually kind of go out and just dry up and turn into little pins. Uh, these uh, the acorns of these trees uh, take two actually growing seasons uh, to mature or two years, you can say two, two, two seasons. Uh, inside the acorn, if you pop that open, the inner part of the leathery covering of the acorn is, is hairy. Its seed, the seed itself, has more tannins than the white oaks, uh, so it makes it more bitter. And again, these are mostly in the Western Hemisphere. Here's a list of ours in, in West Virginia. We have about nine species of red oaks. Uh, and some of these you'll probably be familiar with, probably scarlet oak at least, pin oaks, northern red oak, black oak, some of the more commonly occurring red oaks. Uh, are the section of white oaks are those oaks that have rounded lobes or rounded um, uh, teeth on the edge of their uh, of leaves, on the margin of their leaves. They never bristle tip. Their acorns uh, mature in one season. So the full process happens in one season. And the inner pericarp, that leathery covering on the outside of the nut, is smooth instead of hairy. Its, a, its seed has lower tannins than the, than the red oaks. And uh, these, again, are distributed worldwide, as we saw in that uh, one image. Here's a list of our oaks in West Virginia. We have about seven of them. And uh, you obviously recognize white oak, I'm sure. Bur oak, maybe, um, are familiar with those. Uh, maybe uh, chestnut oak is uh, may get up into some of the north northeastern states. Uh, but we have about seven of them here in West Virginia. Here's a couple of our distributions. Just I put this on to show that the you know they're not everywhere you know uh, some species are more common than others we have here in our state well distributed in within our 55 counties white oak chestnut oak also some people call that rock oak uh, and then red oak northern red oak and down here you can see some of the species that are less well distributed if you know our state of west virginia we have high mountains kind of stretching up through the mid-range of of the state and so on the on the western portion of the state, it has more moisture increasingly as you get in higher elevations than way out in the eastern panhandle. That's where the dry, uh, the dry rain shadow occurs. So out here you have scrub oak and bare oak. You have bur oak kind of in some of these flat bottom uh, wetlands and things. And then, uh, and then very little bit of uh, this uh, southern red oak in the southeastern or southwestern part of the state. So, so diverse distributions. If we expand that to kind of where this group is from, you know, all over the Northeast and Eastern United States, uh, here's a couple of distributions. Um, these are showing these importance values from the these dots. They're the uh, the forest inventory analysis uh, plots that represent the importance. You know, the darker the color, the more. Uh, oh, more of that species exists on those plots. And so white oak, as you can see, is uh, distributed kind of out here in Missouri as a kind of a central uh, tendency. And then all over the eastern United States, northern red oak, similarly, kind of pushed up into the northeast more than the white oak. And then we have that little bare oak that we have out in our eastern panhandle that requires dry sites. It's very has a very small distribution scattered throughout the northeast, probably on drier types of sites. And then bur oak is really kind of known as a prairie species. You can see it, how it's scattered, I mean, kind of parallel to the transition line in uh, that divides the Great uh, Great Plains from the kind of north northern woods of Wisconsin and Minnesota. So so you know oaks are very very wide have a wide diversity of distribution. So pretty cool. Very broad and complex group of plants. So that's a little bit about oaks. Uh, moving into this reproductive biology again, kind of the the birds and the bees of the oak trees. Uh, so uh, acorns, as uh, most seeds do, uh, begin with flowers. Oak trees are monoecious. That is, each tree has both male and female flowers, but the flower parts, but they exist in separate flowers. Uh, the male or staminate flowers, because they contain the stamens that have the pollen, male or staminate flowers are in catkins, uh, and fertilization and fruiting occur in different 
time periods for the white oaks and the red oaks. So in the white oaks, it takes one year for the seeds to go through that full process of, of developing an acorn. And uh, for the red oaks, it takes two years to develop an acorn. Here are some terminal buds. One of the kind of diagnostic attributes I tell people, you know, if you see clustered end buds, think oak, right? So here's some terminal buds of northern red oak. Uh, you can see that uh, there's a terminal bud, and then it has a series of these lateral buds surrounding it. This, these are leaf scars here where leaves were subtending that lateral bud. Uh, I think we add in these, just pointing out these on the surface of these buds are these bud scales that are basically protecting the embryonic shoot that's within inside the, the buds. Uh, if we do a, a cross section of these buds, you can kind of look down and see, you know, wrapped around the outer portion of the of the bud. Here's the terminal bud. These are the bud scales that uh, cut across, and uh, you can see this star, the stellate pith, star shaped pith of the terminal bud. And when you look over, and here's another lateral bud with the stellate pith. Over here, you can't see the stellate pith, but you see these other structures. Those are actually flowers, in, uh, sort of embryonic flowers of the oak. And we'll take another look here at a longitudinal or long ways section of a lateral bud. So see, so you have the connection with the tree, the little twig coming out here, and the embryonic shoot. You can kind of see the leaves, uh, tips of the leaves up here. And uh, so this is the embryonic shoot. And to the side, you have these embryonic catkins or the male flower structures that are kind of packed away in these little buds. And uh, once those buds break, you have the inflorescence that again, we call the catkin. They're actually kind of a, a spike because each of these little staminate flower buds sits right on top of the, of the, of the, um, of the central uh, stalk. And then you can see down here the bud scales from that lateral bud breaking open. And uh, here's the vegetative portion of that. But these flower buds are popping out and beginning to elongate. The simple illustration that we can kind of look at a single flower um, is given here. And uh, it uh, has this little bract. So here is the the catkin portion, the, the stem up and down. And this bract is all that is, is a, a bract is a leafy structure at the base of a flower. This is the base of the male flower, the staminate flower. And the perianth is generally petals and sepals. Normally in flowers, you'd have showy things if you're trying to attract an insect, but because oaks are wind pollinated, they don't have to put a lot of investment in these in these petals and sepals. So they have this kind of reduced form, reduced perianth. And then down here is the stamen. And then the stamen consists of a little thread uh, called a filament and then the pollen sacs, also known as the anther. That's what creates the male gametes, the male sex cells, the, the pollen that will go to fertilize the female flower. So staminate flower. Here's, a, here's an up close and personal to a, to a staminate flower. Uh, and this is a uh, pin, pin oak. So you can see this little leafy bract at the base of the flower and in here packed all tightly are, are the anthers, the only things sticking out. And uh, th these are anthers that have not yet dispersed their pollen. And then up here, you can see that these anthers have dispersed the pollen and very rapidly these flowers dry out and, uh, and kind of wither away. Here they are coming out, these long pendulous strings called what we go, call catkins. And uh, these are coming out at about just before the leaves. And so, um, so the staminate flowers come out before the leaves in, in most of these red oaks and white oaks. Uh, just to give you a, an example of how big these are, I, I had this is about the only one I have. The these are millimeter tick marks, and so each one of these male flowers, each one of these staminate flowers, is about maybe under two millimeters wide and about the same length. And each one of the of these anthers within that contain the pollen is less than a millimeter thick and uh, maybe one millimeter long. So they're fairly tiny little structures, um, uh, but they pack a big punch. And uh, this uh, recent uh, paper by uh, Katz and others, they looked at uh, pollen production for 13 urban North American species and oak happened to be one of them. So, uh, so the, what they did is they sampled, this was up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So they sampled 
the, that set number of each type of tree. So they located it here in A and then B, they, they identified a sample of the crown of these trees. And for each of these areas, they picked out a little cluster of flowers. They, they excised these, they cut them off, brought them into the lab, measured them, counted the number of flowers, counted the number of anthers on each of the stamens as each part of the stamen. And then within each of those, they sampled and tried to estimate the number of pollen grains within those. So pretty interesting, very complex work. And uh, here was their results. So here's the staminate flower structures in this table on the left-hand column. And uh, this is for pin oak and northern red oak. And look at pollen grains per anther. Remember the anthers, the little pollen sac. There are 3,000 to 4,000 pollen grains per anther sac, per, per pollen sac, per anther. There are about four to five anthers per flower. Remember the individual flowers were clustered up along the catkin and there are about 31 to 37 flowers per catkin and then so many catkins per one of their clusters that they that they sampled. So lots, it seems like lots. So when they magnify this, here we're getting to the kind of the, the, the big picture of things. Uh, don't worry about the math or the graphical. What I'm trying to point out is in these graphs, it does show a relationship between the pollen per tree on the y-axis, and look at these numbers, pollen per tree in the billions, right, per tree. So it goes for pin oak from zero to 150 billion, and for northern red oak, it goes from zero to 600 billion pollen grains per tree. And uh, the relationship is just, they're saying that the larger the tree, remember the basal area is kind of the cross-sectional area of the trunk. So the bigger the basal area, the bigger the tree. So the bigger the tree, the more pollen. So, so enormous quantities of pollen are being generated by these, by these oak trees. Down here, I put as an example, um, uh, some of the maples, much less, uh, you know, but still a lot. I mean, zero to 10 billion grains per tree for the Norway maple and so forth. Over here, silver maple, that's a logarithmic scale. So if you exponentiate that 22, you get to about 3.5 billion. Still a lot, still a lot. So pretty interesting. A lot of pollens being produced by these. You need a lot of pollen if you're wind pollinated to send down wind looking for those female gametes, you know, those female flowers. So once uh, that pollen shed, you know, those poor male flowers, you know, dry up and fall off and wind up in the gutter. So sometimes you'll see these big packages of, 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 of catkins uh, strewn along parking lots or in the gutters uh, after, after the uh, pollen flies. Looking at the female flowers, the oak, uh, here's another example using pin oaks. And uh, they're fairly, again, they don't need to attract pollinators and so they're not very showy they exist in the axles the angle of the of the um of the uh, leaf and the woody twig that would be where a, a bud was or the or the female uh, flower primordium so uh they're there we can kind of expand this and look up close and generally when we talk about the female gynesium it's called the female flower uh, we have we talk about three parts uh, generally it's an ovary a style which is just a little structure that kind of uh, stretches out into space so, to some degree and and which contains the stigma which is the receptive portion of the female or pistillate flower so the pistil uh, can ex ex is comprised of three things, the ovary, the style, and the stigma. And then down here, I put a little arrow to the pedicel, which is this, this the um, this little stalk at the base of any flower, any single flower. So there's a pedestal there. So here we have same thing down here, ovary, style, and the stigma, again, the receptive portion. So that's the pistolate flower, non-showy. Here it exists kind of alongside these dried up catkins. They're up in along the stem there in the axles of the leaves. And uh, here's one on black oak. Now this is, these are uh, pistolate flowers that have been uh, pollinated and the tops are kind of dried up, but this is the end of the growing season. You can tell that because the leaves are on the tree, right? And uh, they're kind of yellowish. This is a black oak. You can see these large 
pubescent angular buds clustered again. And uh, so these will fall off and these will persist until the next growing season. Again, black oak is part of that red oak group. Um, you'll also see sometimes these pistillate flowers on stalks or the, you know, the, uh, the, the structure is called a peduncle because this is the base of an inflorescence. And uh, the pistillate flowers are on the ends of those. So this is a little uh, chestnut oak. The simple illustration of the pistillate flower, again, three parts, the ovary kind of at the base, the style, which is that structure that puts the receptive stigma out into space to capture pollen. Uh, and we can go here, there's, there's a whole bunch of other things. And I always want, I wanted to remind everyone, don't worry about these botanical terms. We're just trying to get a sense of what happens during these processes. But there's a whole bunch of different important kind of parts of this that uh, you can kind of go back and look up and Google search and so forth, but I'm going to cover them pretty quickly here. But anyway, so three major parts, the ovary, the style, and the stigma. And if we take a cross section of this ovary, we can uh, kind of get a better view of that. Um, here's this cross section of, an, of a mature ovary in an electron microscope picture. And, uh, and you can see these little O's, those represent ovules that uh, uh, contain the female gametes, and then these septa that divide this, this ovary into really three main locules or parts or chambers of the female flower. So while the figure on the left makes it look like there's one chamber, actually there are three chambers, each containing two little ovules. Um, another part of the tissue uh, of the uh, of the pistillate flower that's really important is this transmit, transmitting tissue. This is where the, the uh, pollen tubes will grow, uh, the pollen tubes containing the male gametes that will uh, go down to try to hit this rudimentary ovule. By the time the, the male gamete gets there, it will be a mature ovule and uh, the fertilization will, will take place. So, so what happens? Here's the simple version. The uh, pollination happens by pollen landing on these stigmas. Almost immediately, the pollen tubes begin to grow. And inside these pollen tubes is that little male gamete, is that haploid cell with half of the genetic information that will merge as it goes down. And the successful one that hits the female gamete will reproduce and turn into the baby oak. So, so these things grow. By mid-May, these pollen tubes stop growing. And for the red oak, generally they, the red oak, plants of the red oak group, they generally stop until the next growing season. So they overwinter in this condition. So these, the, the male gametes are situated down in the tra transmitting tube tissue for uh, you know all of the winter until the next spring, and so but for the white oaks, uh, you know there's like a two week um, resting period, and then those um, pollen tubes continue to grow. They grow down into the mature ovule now, fertilize one of those six ovules that grows into the acorn. So that's the simple version of it. Uh, uh, another recent, fairly recent paper, uh, they've described this in visual that we kind of follow this. Um, this is for the sawtooth oak. Now, this is an exotic species, but we have it, you know, our landowners planted as a, as a wildlife attractant. Uh, but this was a paper by uh, Deng and others in 2022, just last year, uh, trying to describe the pollen tube growth down through these flowers. And you can see this little flower. We've seen one like it. We the ST is the receptive portion, the stigmas, right? The SYs are those structures that hold the stigmas out into space, the, the styles. And these little asters represent some bracts on this um, sawtooth oak flower. Again, just a leafy structure uh, connected to the base of the leaf. So this is it in year one. So we have year one here. This is April 3rd, 2017. This is the pistolate uh, uh, flower at the time of pollination. So the pollen grains are on there. And uh, this is two weeks later. So you can all, all already see the, the darkened color of the stigmas. They've become unreceptive because the pollen's already in there. It's growing away. Um, 
Let's see. And uh, you can see this pedicel. That's the thickened stalk of the acorn. We'll see that through time as it changes. So year one, two weeks later. And this is what it looks like inside. So this is a cross section uh, or a not a cross section, sorry, a trans a, a longitudinal section of the flower where here's the stigma sticking out. Right. Uh, and the style coming down this TTs that transmitting uh, tissue. Again, year one, this was the two weeks after the pollination. So this is post pollination. And over here on the inside, it's kind of the same image, but um, the square uh, shows these little arrows with these reflective pieces. And those are actually what are called callus plugs inside of the pollen tube. So as the pollen tube's growing, it has that important little genetic material down in the male gamete. And behind it, it's placing these little plugs behind it. And so that's what the electron microscope's picking up. And so, so the pollen tubes are still in this little region of the transmission tube uh, two weeks later in spring, but they've grown pretty rapidly, you know, get down in that flower. Um, May 26th, here's what it looks like. Already some scales are starting to develop and that will be the acorn cap. And again, this is the perianthe, kind of the non-showy flower uh, um, petals and sepals. Again, the expanded pedicel. This is just a few, a couple, actually a couple months later or the next month, right? The next month. Um, here it is, June 14th, another month later. These, these um, scales are becoming very thickened. The stigma is still there, but it's kind of decomposing. Here's the perianth, again, not very showy. Uh, so we can just follow these through time. Uh, again, this is the end of the growing season, September already. You know, fall is here. The, uh, the scales have hardened and thickened and provide some good insulation for, uh, you know, the, the gametes inside, both male and female are, are in there. And uh, let's see here. So here's a, here's a cutaway, kind of the same thing. This is the same date, September 20th, as was the previous slide. But on the inside, those pollen tubes, see the reflective uh, little portions, those callus plugs that are inside the pollen tubes that are growing down this transmission to transmission tissue, um, you can, they're showing up. They don't go beyond that. So they're still there. They're going to reside there because this species is one of the red oaks, if I didn't mention it before. So it's going to reside there until the next growing season. So here we are in the next growing season, year two, April 19th, um, 2018, the next year. It was about the time of pollination of the previous year, but you can see that it looks pretty pretty similar to what it looked like September 20th, you know, a few months before, not a whole lot of change has happened, um, um, but let's ch check this out. So here's May 13th, um, a month later, same kind of thing. This has expanded a little bit. The scales are continuing to develop. The inside's expanding. This is a cutaway of the inside. And so um, these large scales have become very thickened. Here's that, uh, here's the here's the style up here, still kind of present, but nothing going on. It's just there. Uh, the, uh, the ovary is this whole portion in here. And the O is pointing to one of these ovules. And this is still, at this stage, it's still um, uh, developing. And uh, here we are in June now. This is at the time of fertilization. So these, these, these pollen tubes have continued to grow down towards that ovule. And uh, this is what it looks like on the outside. Corcus acutissima, the sawtooth oak, has this kind of burr, burry cap. And uh, these are the scales of that. But let's take a look inside. Here we go. So these ovules down here um, in the central part have really expanded and, and have matured. Um, and then we can see a cutaway of the ovary itself where they've excised, they've cut out this ovary so we can see these ovules here and they're all mature ovules. I think we have a top-down view. Yeah, so here's a top-down view. Remember I showed you there were three chambers or locules within each ovary. So here are these sets of mature ovules. Uh, this is the septum, the walls between those locules. Uh, looking down on it, this is June 14th, so middle of June, at the time of fertilization. So something has happened here. We really don't see any traces, but by a couple, a week or so later, we see that 
here are the septa, SC, septa, the walls between the locules. We see that only one ovule has been fertilized. It's beginning to expand, and these others will just kind of wither away. So, so after fertilization and the development of these, some, some terminology that we kind of all probably know, you know, acorns consist of, are basically a nut type of, of fruit, but on the outside, they have this leathery pericarp, this outer covering, and then uh, our, each of them has a fairly distinctive cap. This is the um, chestnut oak cap. Um, the, the, the simple illustration shows us that it is a dicot in contrast to monocots, the grasses and so forth, palms and so forth. Um, it has two cotyledons, and these are the um, these are uh, sort of primary modified leaves that have an enormous amount of energy in them. Uh, the embryo is this little structure at the tip of the acorn, it's again, a cutaway of the acorn. And then you can still see that residual stigma up at the top. And down here, there is a cap scar where the, the fruit, where the nut was connected to the rest of the tree, where the tree fed it and produced all this energy on the inside. So, so two cotyledons. Um, here is an example of an acorn cap fully developed. This is a little pin oak uh, acorn. We see these scales. We've seen them in the photographs as we kind of came through the development of the fruit. Uh, uh, or the fertilization of the uh, of the gametes. <laughs> so, and then uh, here's one for a scarlet oak, kind of similar, but they're all kind of uh, uh, different. Here's on the inside of one of these cupules or caps, you can see these vascular attachments inside where there was the vascular tissue, the tissue that, you know, feeds fluids and, and compounds and resources into the nut. And on the nut side of things, you can see uh, on the cap, uh, cap scar, you can see these vascular traces that um, uh, allowed, you know, the the um, the transmission of um, of resources into the developing acorn. And still, on the mature acorn, you have that little uh, <laughs> little remnant style or stigma stick in there, so it's always there. When we pull off the pericarp, that outer leathery uh, layer, we can see these cotyledons. You can you know, kind of separate these things. And one of the first things you see, especially on these white oaks, this is what, this is a, uh, a chestnut oak, a uh, fruit seed. Um, you can see this radical. It's the primary, re uh, primary root, first thing that comes out of the acorn. As you, if you tear off one of those uh, cotyledons, you can kind of see on the inside the radicals down here, that primary root, and a little plumule, uh, the, the kind of the embryonic uh, shoot that will uh, start growing. Here's what it uh, looks like. The, the, the radical grows a lot farther or a lot more than the plumule initially. It, you know, the, the intent is for that seed is to get that root down into the ground. And, and sure enough, you walk out in the forest or in this case, outside my office, we have a little chestnut oak. And, you know, these things come down almost every year and boy, that little radical comes out straight down into the ground. You can see it kind of penetrating the ground and that thing will grow for quite a ways, quite, quite a long time before um, the plumule is, is shown. Okay, so so that's kind of how the baby oak seed is is uh, is created, and, and now we can kind of bring some of uh, some other ideas uh, about the the other other biological or biotic entities that affect the germination or this process of regeneration of the oaks. So so both. Uh, biotic factors and abiotic factors we'll take kind of a quick look at here. So, so uh, just to acknowledge that as uh, acorns are produced, they're dispersed, right? So they fall to the forest floor, but not all flowers that um, arise on the oaks are successful in becoming an acorn. And this is a little descriptor, a study that was done a little, little bit ago back in the 90s. Uh, showing these graphs where on the x-axis is the date, the month of each of these years. We have 1984 in this top series sequence, 1985 in this bottom sequence, and the vertical axis is the number per square meter per week. So it's, a, it's an example of the magnitude of the production, right? How many were produced? And this 
uh, this line, this single line, is just the number of structures that fell into their traps. And so you can see that a whole lot throughout the course from April all the way into October, a lot of these structures were, were undeveloped uh, female reproductive structures. So tiny little acorns or even flowers that got broken off for one reason or another. So enormous number of these flowers did not produce acorns. Only in this stippled or hatched area, uh, that, that's the number of uh, mature sized acorns that fell, you know, everywhere from July to October. And so, you know, the ones that are falling earlier, they didn't say anything about the viability. It's just simply the size of the acorn, um, whether or not those are viable, the ones that fell in July, eh, it's questionable. Anyway. So the idea is that not all flowers survive. And here's another little study produced about the same time. And this is showing the survival of these flowers and, and how these are interpreted is, is on the vertical axis, the y-axis is percent survival of the flowers. You can think of this, okay? So, so from 0% to 100%. So 100% is when these scientists went out and identified a bunch of flowers to track through time. So at the get-go, all flowers exist. So they're all at 100% survival. And as these months go on from 5, 1, 6, 1, you know, that's, uh, what is that? June, July, let me get this right. May, June, July, August, September. You know, you can see that as the time went on, some of these flowers that they started tracking have declined or disappeared or died. And so by the end of the first growing season, uh, for example, these red oaks, they, uh, there was a, less than 50% of them um, sur had survived. And I can't actually see this uh, little thing, but oh yeah. So yeah, the black oaks are the square, excuse me. The black oaks, 50% and the red oaks under 25% of those survived. Then again, because these are red oaks in the red oak group, bo groups, both black and red are in the red oak um, category. They take two years. And so uh, over winter, you know, they came back and, you know, kind of set, uh, started observing again into 1991, this was, and there goes the plummeting, you know, so these flowers continued to plummet. Maybe they aborted their acorns or maybe they just uh, dried up and, and fell away. So, but by the end of the growing season in, in this year, uh, in the first year of observations, they, um, there was less than 10% of the original flowers that they started tracking had survived and so on for each one of these years. So, you know, the point is that the um, survival of flowers is very tenuous, very tenuous. Okay, and this is part of the reason, you know, <laughs> these little creatures that um, we all love, uh, so cool, you know, the little oak tree hopper that has a little stylet, you know, it's a true, well, it's a leaf hopper. And so they have, I think it's a true bug, hemipterin, and they have these little stylets that stick into a stem and they just start sucking like a little straw. And so enough of those, you know, you put one of those into a little flower stalk and uh, probably going to abort that flower. So, and then the weevils, there's, I think we have about five or seven species of weevils that inhabit the actual acorn. So at the tip of this, there's a little chewing mouth part. They can get in there and some, some, some require that the oak is, the acorn split before they lay their egg on the inside. Some can actually um, uh, burrow in there and uh, put uh, deposit their eggs. So, so anyway, so these are, here's another percent survival chart showing that here again, scientists went out, they identified a bunch of flowers in this case for red oaks in the open squares and white oaks in the diamonds. And so they went out and they started tracking these things and they show that the period of leafhopper feeding right early in the, in the May and June, uh, month uh, really caused a severe uh, decline in the number of these from 100 to, you know, maybe 50% of both red and white oaks. And, and through time, it looks like the red oaks kind of held out uh, for, the, for the first year, uh, while the white oaks kind of declined to nothing <laughs> in that first year, because this is where you would expect um, the white oaks to have a full acorn. Apparently, they didn't get any acorns out of this, uh, out of this study. And the red oaks, they owe again over winter uh, for throughout the year. And then uh, as, as the weevils start ovipositing, you know, depositing their eggs in the, in the 
uh, into the acorns, uh, they declined further, although this is just a little bit up from zero, so maybe they had a few acorns surviving. So this is one of the factors that affect, you know, the production of acorns. Here's another one. This is a colleague of mine. Uh, Jeff Mills was a forester for a long time. He, he, he was out on a field visit and, I, and he showed, it was showing pictures of some of the things. He's a big trapper and hunter and uh, some of the things he got just within around his house. And he was sharing with me that, you know, he's one of these guys that hunts something and kind of looks in the, in the, in the crop. For example, he looked in the crop of this turkey, one of these turkeys, and it had 185 cicadas. This was back when, well, just about like five years ago, we had the big, the, the brood come out and there were 185 cicadas in the crop of this turkey, a single turkey. So uh, it ate a bunch of those things. And then, uh, but the, but the, Interesting thing he told me when he was showing this is that a previous year he had counted 80 white acorn, 80 white oak acorns in a single turkey crop. So given the low likelihood of producing an acorn and the enormous demand for acorns in the environment, you can see why oaks can have a great challenge. It's one of the factors. So in thinking about these kind of predators and the use of these acorns as a resource, uh, I want to bring up this idea that oaks are a masting species. And, and, and masting, you may have heard this as you know, mass seeding, mass flowering, fruiting, mass, mass behavior. Uh, you might want to talk about, you might have heard of these mat, uh, acorns being produced as a bumper crop, you know, a, a year when a whole bunch of acorns come out. So, so the idea in this masting is that. Um, species are masting species if they have synchronous and highly variable seed production, uh, you know, among these, uh, uh, among the years uh, for a given population, right? So, and, and synchrony has to do with, with a flowering synchro synchrony. I see a little spelling mistake there, <laughs> where abundant flowers are, are for a given species are all produced at the same time, right? All of a sudden, uh, you either have everything or nothing. You rarely have, you know, some plants producing a bunch and some not producing any. So, uh, so massing has to do with synchrony and and the high interannual variability. Some years there's a bunch, some years there's not many. So here's some examples. Um, so uh, so this is a little study back in the late '90s by Bill Healy, who is one of our West Virginia woodland owners now. <laughs> and uh, uh, he looked at thinned and unthinned stands of Northern Red Oak. He was a, wild, he was a wildlife biologist looking out of interest for oak production. And some, some trees are better producers than others and they classified these trees. And he found that in this period from 1986 to 1996, this 10 year period, um, Basically, when there was good production in this species of red oak, all of the producers produced a bunch, right? Even the poor producers relative to their previous years uh, produced more than on average. And so that is the synchronous part of it. So all of these species, all of these individual trees of this species are producing a bunch of acorns at the same time. And then generally what happens after a good year of production, there's a great you know, kind of decline in productivity uh, of the acorns. And you can see this happen both in thin stands and unthin stands. So there's a great, in, so first thing, there's synchrony there. And there is interannual variability where from one year to the next, it's, it's pretty random. Um, one of the things that has come out in this discussion of, of, of acorn production is, is there a period in which these things are produced? And so far, there's real no kind of like red oak acorns produce a bumper crop every seven years or something like that. There's no really periodicity involved in this. Okay, some bunches of hypotheses about this, too complex to get here, but you know, one of these ideas is that these, this, this uh, masting in plants has evolved, has, is an adaptation to, this, to predators. 
And the, the, the hypothesis is called predator satiation, or basically overwhelming the, the predators at one time with a whole bunch of seeds that can't really be completely consumed by all the predators. And in addition, the, the, the animals, the creatures that rely on these seeds for their for resources for their own lives and livelihoods all right um a lot of them take things and package them away in different spots and so um it you know especially these scatter hoarding you know rodents you know they'll actually plant these things and they can never use all of these um all of these acorns and so some will germinate so part of it's a this kind of synergistic kind of relationship between these things or mutualistic um, and then another uh, idea, maybe pollination failure, where if you can imagine, remember those bumper crops in, in the, in the uh, graphs, if there's pollination failure for one reason or another, in a, it could happen on a regional scale, right? You get a uh, late, uh, uh, late spring freeze and damage a bunch of the flowers, uh, you know, the catkins. Or you have very moist condition where those the pollen's just not going to fly that year. So you can imagine that could have a regional or species wide uh, effect. So just a couple uh, these these papers. Uh, Walt Koenig, I guess, is, Dr. Koenig is uh, has produced an enormous amount of really cool papers about some of these ideas about about masting. He, he's a, a, a avian bio, avian zoologist, I think, by trade. So. Um, so some of the factors that uh, influence acorn production uh, could be weather, like I mentioned some, you know, warm, not hot spring temperatures are positives, you know, you want nice warm temperatures so that the pollen will fly, right, and uh, get to those uh, pistillate flowers. Negatives, you know, things that might, you know, hamper uh, production. Uh, late spring frost, summer droughts, you know, you get through the summer, you're having, you know, those pistillate flowers developing uh, or acorns developing. And so uh, any of those could really hamper production of these things. And then, uh, as I mentioned, high humidity during pollination is another one. So, so weather is one type of, one type of uh, factor affecting that. Also premature decisions for any one of the reasons uh, that I mentioned, insects, you know, uh, uh, hail damage, uh, um, pollination failures, fertilization failures, these, these um, flowers will be, abs will abscise, will fall off or be aborted and, um, and few will remain. So, uh, so premature abscission can be, ca can be uh, caused by any one of these uh, factors. Um, when, you know, finally the establishment portion of, you know, reg the regeneration process, you know, the regeneration process really being from, you know, flowering through the establishment of new individuals, new oaks, um, may be one of the more complex parts of all of this, you know, in our in our mindset about oak regeneration, we have this concept of this advanced reproduction, we want to try to get these seedlings established on the forest floor before we take off or before, you know, the overwood, the overstory trees are removed and full sunlight's on the forest floor. And then it's just the wild, wild west, whatever's there is going to grow and compete and so forth. So we want to get these strong, sturdy uh, little oaks developed. And so on the left is this example of a little typical understory advanced reproduction and uh, you know the distinct one of the distinguishing terms in forestry. Sometimes you come where we talk about reproduction is the actual element, the individual plant out there, and regeneration is more of the process. So, so advanced reproduction here on the left, and you can imagine each of these little twigs has a little dormant bud or a bud on it, and so um, it's kind of diffuse. It's diffuse. Uh, growth that'll happen if the if the sun all of a sudden starts shining in that directly, and this is what we're really trying to get over on the right hand side. You know, a a a a, a seedling sprout uh, that has all of its resources concentrated in that apical uh, bud system up at the top. And so, so the idea is if we can get these things established once the once the overwoods off. Once the sunlight is fully put on the forest floor, uh, the, these are going to actually sprout and turn into one of these and have really good focused growth. Uh, this is here's an example of advanced oak reproduction. 
Um, this is on our research forest, little uh, multi-stem species. Uh, this is this area had been burned, has been burned in the past. It's a research site. Dr. Jamie Schuler is doing a lot of work here at WVU on this. And this is uh, you can actually kind of see this is the stump of the of the advanced reproduction. I've identified these these older um, stumps uh, places that sprouts have been here before. And so when you pull one of these things out of the ground. It has this large root. Here's my hat. Okay. So, and here's the large kind of carrot like root system with these sprouts. And so, these little oak seedlings have a sprout dieback re sprout phenomenon uh, that allows them to persist in the understory and develop these large root systems. Uh, we dissected this uh, root and we counted like 12 to 13 uh, growth rings in that. So, some of these oak seedlings in the understory can actually be very old. I actually think this may have arisen. We had a we had an ice storm damage that kind of cracked out the tops. I think it was the President's Day storm where a bunch of snow fell on leaves, you know, break, broke out a bunch of branches. I think a lot of these uh, started getting their uh, beginning uh, at that time period. Anyway, so it's a very old root system. So so the idea is to get these things established in the understory. One of the things that you know these oak seedlings face is while they can kind of persist as these seedling, you know, um, sprout, dieback, re-sprout seedlings in the understory, they do need light. And there's a, in our forest, there's a lot of shade. Uh, you may have heard of, you know, the changing fire regimes, creating more mesophytic uh, forests or moisture, uh, you know, moist forests. Uh, and look at all these different layers that you have an upper canopy, mid-story, and then the understory. So, so anything that's happening on that forest floor is really, really happening in low light conditions. You know, so the idea is to kind of in, in actually using prescribed fires or sometimes chemicals, not promoting any one of those over the other, but, uh, you know, these methods to eliminate some of that shade in this mid-story is what, uh, you know, the silviculturists are after. So this is a little prescribed fire, fire that Jamie Schuler did. You can see all these small little twigs of that heavy low shade being cast on the floors for uh, trying to get to the, some of these you know, it does kill back the top, but the oaks are regenerating or re-sprouting, re but so are things like the cherries and so forth. So again, this is a very complex part of, uh, of, the, of the whole regeneration process. Again, so we've probably heard of the oak regeneration problem. I'm not going to go into this deeply, but there's all sorts of factors that uh, people point to, weather, climatic conditions, seed predators, browsers. We know we have, uh, I don't know if I'm talking about deer here. I may have taken some of that out. Diseases, non-native invasive species, and then humans, you know, uh, not only because we've suppressed fires and uh, we are, you know, but our our intentional woodland management uh, or the lack thereof. So uh, all of these are factors in, in this oak regeneration problem. Have to point to the deer always and the turkeys. Remember I mentioned that one turkey ate 80 white oak acorns. Well, the deer do the same thing. They, they feed on them, they rely on them. And in our state and probably similar around the state, I have around the states, I've seen graphs, 80% uh, of our forest inventory analysis plots have, have moderate to severe deer browse damage. So it's, an, it's a region-wide issue. Uh, you know, not sure what the solution to that is, maybe none, but uh, you gotta talk about that. Here's what here's kind of one example. This is a, a deer exclosure. You've all seen pictures about these. Lots of vegetation on the inside, outside, not a whole lot. And probably if there's acorns, they'd be in there, not out here. Okay. Lots of different diversity to talk about. Here's kind of the here's our state's view of this whole thing. You know, if you look closely at these bars, 2000 is the oldest estimate of the uh the year 2000 of the number of trees for each of these species in our state. Uh, 2008, 2013, 2008 is in the gold bar, 2013 is in the black bar. If you look at the oaks, they're all declining in numbers. And if you look at other things like the maples, they're increasing in numbers. So we're getting more maples than losing the oaks. Here's the real descriptor. You know, this is a, um, this is the uh, species as a percentage of total trees in this size class. So look way out here at these large diameter trees, you know, the 26 to 30 inch diameter trees. It's still pretty much dominated by oaks, oak of, of many species. 
and uh, fewer, fewer other species. But as you go down here into the smaller diameter classes, we have hardly any representation of the smaller diameters by oaks, but these others are, are gaining in importance. And so that's just pointing us to the change and other changes happening in the world that we're, we're losing the high concentrations of oaks and we're uh, getting other species in place. And so that is kind of the big picture or maybe smaller picture of uh, uh, the oak regeneration process from flowering to establishment. And, you know, hopefully I've painted a, a little bit of a general picture of how that all happens and hopefully brought to a little more or uh, enhanced appreciation of uh, oak regeneration uh, that we can all uh, uh, be inspired to, uh, to work on uh, the issue of the oak regeneration problem, if it is a problem. So, uh, Peter, that's that's it for me. Dave, that's great. I just that was really a lot of fun. Um, I have to say, though, you were downplaying the importance of that terminology. But I think everybody's been at a party and they've run out of things to talk about, and so to be able to draw from some of those reproductive structure terms, you know, it's just it just brings a whole new dimension to who you are as a person when you're able to carry that into a conversation. So um, <laughs> that's funny. And with, with, yeah, right. <laughs> with, <laughs> with that, let's, uh, let's open the floor to questions. I'll, let me do a little housekeeping as people are typing in the questions. When you registered for the webinar, you uh, submitted information that I'll be using to create a uh, continuing education document. So if you requested continuing ed credit, you'll be receiving that from me as an email. It takes me a couple of days to do that. And this webinar will be is being recorded. It'll be posted to the Forest Connect channel of YouTube. So that's youtube.com slash Forest Connect. And we can, I'll scroll back up. So Dave, I'll read the questions. You can obviously jump in and uh, uh, and uh, review the questions. So uh, Carl wants to know if acorns are edible. Yes. You know, I, 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 I didn't mention, I, I grew up in California. I went to forestry school and one of my, uh, so we were very well aware of oaks because oaks are dominant out there too in some of those forests. Although it was a non-commercial species at the time I went to school there. And so we so one of the things I, I did, I worked with some oaks for my senior project and so forth. And and yeah, one of the things we said is uh, the thing about oaks, you have to get rid of the tannic acid in it to make it edible. And so one of the ways you do that, you put you you kind of crush them up and put them in cheesecloth and then put them in the back of your toilet. <laughs> you know, so so the water comes up, it sits there, it sits there, and, and flushes flush, it, right? flush the toilet, and then yeah. you bring it back up. And so, you know, I don't know, you know, that was one of those kind of solutions that I'm not sure how many people actually do. <laughs> you could also probably put it in a pot of water, change that pot of water every day or so. Yeah, I think and there's some <laughs> boiling solutions, but I tell you, I use the boiling solutions. I we like I said, we had a chestnut oak outside the double doors at school, and you know, I I tried that, and I it, it, with the uh, with a chestnut oak. It's a white oak, but uh, um, probably probably not one of the you know, the sweetest oak acorns. And uh, I, I I I did that, and I actually covered them in sugars sugar and uh even the grad students wouldn't eat them so uh yeah. i don't know how, i don't know <laughs> how edible they are but yeah they're edible the indians used to use them and and uh and they were they were a staple of the indians so they they had their methods yeah and i see for people that are looking at the chat i think i saw somebody posted a web link to how to cook or prepare yeah uh, acorns i i did i remember talking to landowner groups and saying oh the the white oaks are sweeter than the red oaks which is a relative perspective <laughs> exactly and, and so I, I remember i thought well i really need to put my money where my mouth is so one day i was out in the woods and i picked up a chestnut oak split it open with my pocket knife and just ate it raw i oh, should say yeah. i i put it in my mouth raw yeah. Yeah. i could i couldn't get that spit that out fast <laughs> enough i mean <laughs> It was, it just, you know, the astringency of that was, was pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. So 
Gary wants to know, and you mentioned that the oaks are monoecious, so you have both male and female on the same tree, but mm -hmm. in different flowers. Can yes. a single, can an isolated oak tree produce viable acorns? So can it be self self pollinating? Yeah, they're not self compatible. They're incompatible, really. In fact, you know, on the surface of these stig, on the stigma surface, they have little receptor cells, and so there's. You know, a lot of this is still being investigated. It's really just a fascinating topic that, um, but there, there are signals that apparently the stigma relies on or some of the cells of the stigma to allow the pollen tubes in. And then even after that, you know, this, the transmission tissue, there's, uh, there's some kind of signals going on. It, I don't think they've really been identified, um, but um, that that filter those, you know, cell, because they're self incompatible, you know, which pollen is from me, you know, <laughs> we're not going to reproduce with ourselves. So, so, um, so a, an, an oak that's all by itself will generally will not, I'm going to say, I'm going to just say generally, because there's never, you know, <laughs> um, however, this pollen can travel a long way. So being alone in the world as an oak tree you're, you know, you're really not too far from, from someone else, pollen-wise. So I'm not sure if I answered that question, but yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Per perfectly. So Jennifer picks up the dried mats of uh, male <laughs> oak male <laughs> flowers from gutters and puts yeah. them into her flower bed as mulch. Yeah. She's wondering, you know, it's a way of just keeping them out of, you know, blocking the gutters and blocking storm drains. Yeah, right but is there any, so is there anything special about those in terms of the compounds when they break down that's either advantageous or disadvantageous to use it as a mulch? And she mentions, in, for example, the tannins that may be present. No, uh, yeah, the, the, well, what came to mind is something outside the question, but um, but I think that's fine for mulch. You know, it'd probably be kind of one of the brown, you know, if you're composting it, it'd be a, a brown kind of thing, not a whole lot of nutrients left in it, I think. But prior to that, you know, that's a target. If you take some of these flowers and look look under a microscope, you see all sorts of little thrips on it. These are little things that are probably just, I don't know, scraping something off the surface, but they're not really damaging it. But there are other things that, you know, that's a lot of uh, nutrition in that pollen, right? Uh, that's the genetic material, which is a rich compound. And uh, so things want that stuff, you know, so there's all sorts of little uh, creatures that uh, want to eat that. So, but once the pollen's been, you know, yeah, put it in your garden. It's uh, probably a good, uh, a good mulch. So no harm may or may not happen. I don't think so. I've never except. seen anything. I've never seen anything about that. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and sometimes even in observations, you know, this stuff, you know, falls on lawns and stuff. I've never really seen any kind of like negative impact. Like I've seen butternut trees fall down and the grass around it wouldn't grow. You know, it's like, mm. Uh, you know, because all the whole jug loan thing. And I'm, and I'm thinking, is that because the jug loan? So sometimes you see these things in nature that, you know, give you clues, but I've never seen anything about the, about the, uh, the cat, the spent catkins being used as compound as being a negative. Okay. Uh, so Colin, um, so the oak trees are wind pollinated, but is there any, given the, the discussions we've heard you know, broadly about declines in pollinators, does that carry over to any impact on oak reproduction? Well, only that, like uh, what comes to mind is, uh, uh, I don't know if you have had, had Doug Tallamy on your, on your seminar, but uh, he's a He's an entomologist from University of Delaware. He's written some really amazing books. I mean, bestsellers. And his latest one is The Nature of Oaks. And, uh, and, and he points out just the number of creatures that rely on these different oak, you know, on the oaks at different times of the year, you know, things you wouldn't even think about. I mean, you know, we all focus on a monarch, right? It's kind of like, uh, you know, but there's all sorts of ugly insects. I shouldn't even say that, but there's all sorts of insects that don't really attract us and uh, that are important to our eco, our, our biosphere, right? And, and oaks support a whole lot of those. Um, even ones that, 
um, he was saying that he was wondering why these one bird, these birds were out in his tree. And he looked and there's this little one little worm that overwinters and it looks like a little twig. I forget what it is, but, uh, you know, so there's just all sorts of creatures that rely on these oaks. So from the oak regeneration standpoint, you know, everyone who likes deer, you know, think, oh, if we don't have any oaks, we're not going to have any acorns to feed the deer. Well, there's a whole lot more that these oaks feed than than just the deer. So, so from that standpoint, oaks are a very critical kind of thing. But, but, but direct impact to some kind of pollinator, I mean, these are wind pollinators, so it shouldn't have any kind of direct impact. Okay. Uh, Gary wants to know what role the major stressors such as the spongy moss defoliation. So any, I guess any kind of defoliation, what does that do to acorn production? Yeah, so, so you know the acorn production exists at the tips of the twigs. And so things like cicadas, right, they might come in and, and lay their eggs in the fine little twigs and then that portion of the twig dies off. So that could have some kind of local or regional effect. I, I haven't really have seen that directly, but I mean, imaginably it could, because sometimes you go into these areas where the brood is and there's all these little patches on trees that are dead, right? So those aren't going to pr be producing acorns. And for the red oaks, that's going to be two years, right? So um, it, yeah, so, so so that could have a big effect. And um, let's see, where's I going with this? Oh, uh, oh, defoliators like the spongy moth, right? The spongy mm -hmm. moth is right. a defoliator. So yeah, I mean, that could, um, you know, Acorns require a lot of energy and allocation of energy within trees and even with, you know, between branches and so forth is, is, I don't want to say it's understudied, but there's a lot that, you know, you know, if, if you have a complete defoliation, you're not producing photosynthate, you're not producing sugars that can go in to make, you know, the stuff that goes into the acorns. And so easily I can imagine that would, that would have a big effect on, on production. But, but again, in, in kind of looking through this stuff, I, the, the, there were, that was not a specific defoliation was not necessarily a specific cause of, uh, uh, of a, of a mass failure, because really the, 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 it's the bumper crop. That's the kind of the exception to the rule, right? So most years, you know, there's kind of like this low production of, of acorns. And um, so, you know, it, it, that would be a difficult one to test. You know, if if you have a if you have a complete defoliation of a zone of oaks, or you know, um, does that? How would you ever know that that would have been a bumper crop had that not happened? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a complex right. question, but yeah, it sure has an effect on on the tree tree health and vigor. So do do defoliators like spongy moth eat the fruiting structures? So the, they would, so they would, yeah. the fruiting structures would start to emerge maybe a little bit before the foliage does, but they would be present as the foliage is developing. So would the spongy moth, presumably it's going to, it's going to consume those, those flower early fruiting structures. Yeah. My guess is no, because uh, I'm not an entomologist, but, you know, from the observations I've made of spongy moth, yeah, I used to live up in central Pennsylvania. So, you know, uh, spongy moth comes on, you know, it has the, the, the tiny, tiny little, once the, once the larvae hatch, they spin this little thing out and they fly in the air usually, and they land on oak trees and then they go right to those leaves and they start, you know, gnawing a hole in the leaf surface, which kind of expands. And so it can have pretty severe damage. And by that time, I mean, these flowers are not, I would guess that they would not prefer those. Maybe if there was nothing left of the leaves, but by the time there's nothing left of the leaves, it's kind of well off. You know, they've gone through a couple instars, they're growing bigger. And, uh, you know, if, if they've defoliated, that, that's a great question. You know, this whole effect of defoliation on fruit, on, on flowering and fruit production in oaks. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to like trace that out, but, but it's just like the structure I've shown some pictures, you know, it's not too, it's not too, uh, doesn't take too long to get some of those scales developing on the outside of the, of the pistolate flower, the female flower. And so, you know, that's, that's some protection against, you know, something wanting to gnaw on it. Yeah. All right. Jared uh, is from New England and he says that they are being encouraged to harvest mature trees to promote quote, young forest habitat 
and wants to know if there's a risk um, that they're hastening the loss of oaks and the overall composition of the forest. Well, <laughs> so yeah. I when when I when I read that question, I was recalling the graph that you showed the relationship between tree basal area and pollen production. Yeah, um, and presume that I think I've seen graphs that show tree size positive correlations between uh, oak tree diameter or basal area and acorn production. Yeah, so so the reason I paused on that, so so yeah, that that, that that was in urban areas, and and you know pollen is a health risk and all that kind of thing, and um, but but what came to mind with the question was more of a political one, <laughs> and uh, ah. you know we are being I think the question was we're being encouraged to harvest large trees to favor young forests, right? Correct. So that could be, that could be coming from a number of places. It could be coming from wildlife, you know, interests. Uh, to create these early successional forests, so so called, you know, because you know that puts more food down into the more popular game species, right? Or it could be coming from foresters themselves that want to cut big trees, right? I mean, the honest truth is that I mean, both of those, the, both of those could be, uh, because I mean, yeah, if you want to create young forests, that's what you do. You cut cut the big trees. Now the question is, is the intent of the of the harvesting is the silvicultural objectives, which sometimes we have, sometimes we don't. You know, our ethic as foresters is to look at the direction we're moving these stands and forests and to see to see if those match our objectives or the landowner objectives right so if the landowner objective is just to 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 extract wood that's one thing but if it's to generate you know a better forest uh, or a different type of forest um then um you you know it's it's probably okay to cut the big trees and you will have younger forests more than likely unless you have too many deer um, but you may not have regenerating oak forests that's the thing so if oak regeneration is an objective that's a costly one that's a costly objective that we're not seeing as as the data show as i showed that graph um, we're not seeing our oak regeneration we're not seeing oak forests regenerating beneath themselves as we say it's not like it's not like we're we're, they're going to be endangered or anything, but it's just we're, we're changing the composition of our forests uh, through, you know, all of these factors that I mentioned, you know, uh, abiotic factors, uh, biotic factors, and, you know, our, I guess we're part of nature, human, but human factors is a big thing. Mm -hmm. So did Dave, I get you and to I, that? Did I get to yes, that? <laughs> you, no, you did. That, and that was a perfect, very, very good response. <laughs> You, you and I were just for Jared and for others, uh, Dave and I were speaking before the webinar about a program that's offered by the Forest Service called Silva. So Silva is a software program, but it's also a, a, a Silva culturally based set of practices and protocols. And they have a training specific to oak regeneration. Uh, they offer that in Northwestern Pennsylvania. So that would, if you're interested in that, you can send you can maybe find it online, send me an email and I'll get you in touch with the uh, people that run that. It's a, it's well worth the time if you're trying to regenerate oak. Uh, so, all right, let me, I got to talk faster here. We've got 22 messages still coming in. Uh, Eli wants to know what's the best time of year to tell if it's going to be a mast year. And is there some systematic way to know it's a mast year other than just saying there's lots of acorns? Yeah, well, I know our Forest Service has an acorn count that they participate in, and, and honestly, I haven't tracked that very much, but yeah, I think, um, you know, in advance, I mean, you know, I'm not sure how much in advance until it's happening, you know, it's, uh, you know, predicting, let's see, I think uh, the Forest Service up in Warren, Pennsylvania did some some of that early on, I think it came out of there where they were trying to predict, it may have been oaks, but you know, the, the best factor to evaluate if it was going to be a successful oak season, if if there was a, a, a successful count of the number of flowers, I think that was for oak. Jeez, I'm pulling that from deep down. <laughs> but, uh, but, but predicting oak, um, successful oak acorn production is, is not a very well-developed science. I'll just say that. 
so that kind of leads into Colin's question about, you know, the whole notion of, I mean, we foresters, you know, grew up hearing, you know, these, in fact, I think we had to memorize the kind of the periodicity of, of bumper crops of maple and oak and ash and mm -hmm. these other species, but yet you're describing maybe something that's more recently that, that the, the ability to predict or the, the, the variance around those averages is really high. Oh, absolutely. So you know, and I mentioned just a couple of the hypotheses about the whole masting thing. You know, why is it happening? What are the factors that are affecting it? You know, again, the, 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 the interannual variation is one of the attributes about masting. That means the variation between years is just very high and it's and there's no real periodicity that has been detected um and and so some of these some of what can happen in in some of these hypotheses really interesting um is that you can have like a low level of production and then in a period that should maybe all prepped up for um, for a high production, you have lots of flowers, the pollination is great. You can have what's called a veto, <laughs> like an environmental veto, where you have a freeze or something that's just completely uh, random that, uh, that impairs you know, the, the resources that have already been put into some of the flowering and structures that are in place. So, uh, so there's all sorts of different hypotheses on what's happening. Yeah, and some of this is resource base you know it's a function of resource resources availability some storage is it you know but but it's it's really there's still a lot that's very much unknown about this stuff okay becky says is it realistic to manage for more oaks or are maple and other species maples and other species the way to go for natural areas um let's see say that one more time so so you're describing i think where this is coming from is you know, you're describing the challenges of being able to sec to successfully produce acorns and mm -hmm. get those acorns to the point of becoming a seedling and eventually a sapling so mm -hmm. her question is is it really realistic to even try to manage for more oak to try to to do that not that you're going to you know do the opposite of that. you're not going to try to limit the oaks but maybe just forget about trying to get oak and instead just go with maple or is there is there a realistic opportunity and circumstances when you can regenerate oaks yeah well i mean that's that's the question right i mean as i was mentioning you know our, our, when you're when, if we think if we say we are managing forests that is contingent upon having some kind of an objective for that forest right whether that's a giant national forest or whether that's a you know 30 acre track or 10 acre track or five or small little woodlot you know and so um so if you don't have oak regeneration as objective no big deal right and and then the other kind of thirty thousand view uh, you know foot view of that would be what is happening, you know, from whoever, you know, whoever's interested, whether that's a nation or a, a group of ecologists or whoever, you know, what is the consequence of our changing the, the composition of our forests? So then the politicians get involved and they say, is there an incentive for this, right? Is there, is there any kind of incentive? Because it would be costly to really try to assure oak regeneration. It's not easy uh, because if it were, we'd be having it, right? Because we love oaks and other things love oaks. And in fact, one of the manifestations of this is the White Oak Initiative. I think you mentioned it earlier. Yeah, the White Oak Initiative is, you know, the bourbon industry has discovered that, you know, white oaks may be becoming scarce because of this oak regeneration. And their industry relies on white oak. I took, I told you, I took some slides out about that. But one of the differences between the white oaks and the red oaks is you can make barrels out of white oaks and, and not red oaks, for example. And uh, so they have recognized that. And so they're starting to put money into these, you know, research and you know, all, all this stuff going on to, uh, you know, 
engage this issue. So, um, so there's no short answer to that. Is it better? I mean, I wouldn't worry about it. If you're like me, I'm trying to minimize stress in my life, you know, so I wouldn't stress about it, but it, it does, there are consequences of our changing the composition of our Eastern forests. And, and it's a long time frame, right? The, the, bur the bourbon industry is thinking about making barrels a hundred years from now. So it's, you know, they, they can't wait for 90 years and say, all right, where's all the, where are all the white oak trees? Yeah. So that's a, yeah. it's a, it's a long time frame kind of question. Yeah. We'll see if that's a hundred years. Yeah. I right. don't know. Maybe sooner than that. We, you right. Know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I, I, I pulled that. That was maybe too quickly to offer a specific uh, a rotation I like, age. I like taking the healthy skeptic approach, you know, it's like, Oh, a hundred years. Huh? Well, maybe sooner than that. I mean, all these white Oaks in the Eastern United States, you know, this as well as I do, you know, most of these, most of this is probably on private non-industrial properties. So access to, to the white oak, you know, it's, it's an issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So William wants to know if you can describe uh, the best way to plant an acorn. He's tried various methods with <laughs> very little success. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I've actually grown coast coast live oak for a bank out in California when I was, you know, they wanted a little seedling to give away. And and one of the one of the things, of course, you want to do first is that once you collect your acorns, um, if the, the, they, the red oaks have to be stratified. The white oaks, you can if you collect them and they're not already germinating, you know, uh, that usually when white oaks fall on the ground, they start germinating immediately and getting that root into the ground, that radical. Uh, the red oaks are different, you know, they, they'll, they'll start germinating the, the following spring. I probably didn't mention that, but, um, uh, and, and so those generally take and put in to some vermiculite, some moistened stuff, stick in your refrigerator. And then, uh, you know, as the, as the radical pops out that, you know, that next spring, you can see which ones are going to be good and which ones may not, may not, may not grow. So, um, and then, and then the whole establishment thing's the same way. You know, where are you going to put these things? Are you actually going to put these outside? Well, um, there's this ho whole string of literature about, you know, how much of the cotyledon can be eaten off by predators and still have that seedling grow. And it, it's actually quite a bit, you know, but, um, you know, just because something rips off the cotyledon, it doesn't mean necessarily it's going to kill that you know, developing seedling. So, you know, there's, there's a bunch of information about that. So, so the best way is, you know, get that acorn, stick it in the ground, put some protective structures around it for both rodents and large herb herbivores and, uh, and protect it with a gun every night and day. Now, uh, just protect it and keep it weeded, of course, you know, and uh, cultivate it like you would really any other planted tree. It takes time. I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy to plant trees. And uh, if you're successful at it, you know, boy, pat yourself on the back. I saw a landowner who had a, had made a raised bed just out of two by fours. And it maybe was three feet wide and eight feet long and filled with just organic material from the forest. He had put the acorns in there on a fairly regular grid, not being too particular about it. Uh -huh. uh, and, and then the important fact was, uh, and these are mostly red oaks, he'd put hardware cloth. So I don't remember if it was a quarter inch or a half inch mesh hardware cloth over the top of the raised bed to keep the squirrels out. And then mm -hmm. in the spring, when they were sprouting, he'd have to, he'd have to lift the, the hardware cloth. Otherwise <laughs> the, the acorns would grow up through the hardware cloth and he couldn't disentangle the, yeah. the stem from the, from the wire mesh. So, and yeah. he had, he had very good luck getting them to sprout. Now, then the next step, as you were just saying, is like, what do you do with them? I've seen when I was at Purdue, they did walnuts into uh, one quart milk yeah. containers or half and half containers. And then they'd poke a hole in the bottom and essentially they would do, you know, two-year-old containerized planting stock. But that was for the, wow. for the, for the genetically improved black walnuts. So yeah. Yeah. At the nursery, of course, they, they, uh, they trim the roots off as they're, you know, depending on if you're, if they're doing two O's or one O's or whatever, you know, one-year-old or two-year-old seedlings. 
all the all the the, you know, the I remember who was that Cormanic, Paul Cormanic down south was promoting these big red oak seedlings. And I, I'm not sure what's happened to that kind of research, but that was pretty cool. And uh, cause they, because they grow better, you know, the bigger the seedling, the better they grow. Uh, but what, one, of the, one of the things about growing your own with acorns is that I was telling you back when I was a senior in college, I, I created this little root growth chamber for my senior project and monitored uh, root growth of acorns of coast live oak, Quercus agrifolia, for 32 days. And these things grew three quarters of a meter, the roots did, in 30, in about a month, really, in a full month. I measured them every day. They grew about almost an inch a day, something like that, or a centimeter and a half, maybe. And uh, and the plumule was only maybe six inches tall, you know, the, t the, the shoot. And that didn't come, start coming up until the, the root was already a foot long or so. And so, so, you, so you wind up with these big, long roots. It's a really significant tap root. And as long as it has space down there, I think it's, it'll keep going. <laughs> you know, so, so it's tough to, tough to manage that long root. Um, when you're when you're when you work with acorns and so yeah if you have a, a short little chamber that'll start winding around the bottom we we actually had like the six inch long plugs that once the tap root gets down to the bottom it it dies off and the lateral start forming you know a more solid you know root ball but there's a lot of plasticity in those was okay. i don't even know if that was a question or was it uh, oh it was, it was a follow-up from the planting question yes yes okay. Uh, so Deb wants to know if there are attributes of acorns from older trees that make them better than acorns from younger trees. It's a good question. I don't think there is. I mean, I can't imagine. Uh, I haven't seen anything published on that. Like we took, you know, acorns from older trees and younger trees to see if they either were, you know, different weights, different sizes. They produce seedlings that grew faster or better or whatever. I had just have not seen that. Interesting question, though. Yeah. Yeah. Does it take a while for young oak trees to produce? You know, well, I don't know. It's they're they're still producing when they're big. But, uh, you know, in general, in I think uh, I don't know how animals are in, in terms of aging, but, uh, you know, at some point they become mature and start produce, reproducing and then at some point they stop reproducing, I think. So I'm not quite sure if it's that's the same way for trees. Even these old decrepit, you know, snags in the woods, if they have a branch with a flower on it, that could be pollinated. So uh, great question. All these, yeah. you know, there's so much we don't know about our forest ecosystem. You know, in life in general, you know, we think we have, we know everything, you know, in our in our reality, but there's just so much that that is so interesting and all these great questions. Mm -hmm. So I, the, I remember a statistic, and I'm sure I'm uh, forgetting a lot of the details, but something along the lines of uh, oak trees don't really become uh, functionally, I mean, so they can produce acorns at a young age. And you showed the sawtooth oak. I've seen nine-year-old saplings producing acorns on sawtooth oak, but, mm -hmm. but, the, but really good production from our native oaks doesn't happen until they're about 16 inches in diameter. And so... You know, mm -hmm. so you're talking about some of the harvesting practices and we were earlier, if you're, you know, if people are looking at 14 inch diameter oak trees and saying that's mature and you, and you can take it to the mill and they'll saw boards from it, but it may not have really started to hit its, its mm -hmm. uh, stride for, yeah. uh, for reproduction until it gets much bigger. So, Interesting. Uh, so last question and. Dave, you've been very generous to stick around this long. Oh, what pr mm -hmm. what proportion of a cut root can an oak sapling regenerate from? So if you're so you showed the picture of the the burning. I'm guessing this is where the, the source of this. You showed the burning All right. mm -hmm. in the dieback. So how much of that root do you need, or is there some some structure? on the root itself, and I'm thinking about the root collar, mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what part of the root is necessary and important to, to re-sprout, to form a sapling? Yeah, so, so the shoots come from dormant buds. You know, oaks do not, as far as I know, oaks do not have like this adventitious development of shoot tissue, like, like 
um, tree of heaven and, and, and black locust where, where if you cut the, the, the uh, tree down, you know, from the roots, they'll be spontaneously develop, you know, shoots that come up, up out of the ground. And that's all adventitions kind of generated spontaneously in place. But, but the, but the, but the shoots we see both epicormic sprouts up on the high parts of the, of the tree coming out on branches or so forth. If there's a disturbance, it's just a way of a secondary leaf bearing system that the tree has adapted, has evolved to, to have. Those are the same types of buds that produce these little, you know, shoots from the, from the seedling. And so um, you need to have, yeah. The, so the root collar is actually kind of a composite of this continuing sprouting. And so every time you have a little axle, uh, there's a, some kind of a lateral bud there. So, and one way to think about it is um, if you have a seedling coming from an acorn, that seedling grows. And at the base, right there in the cotyledon, I think there are uh, is a lateral bud form it formed. So down low is where it's important uh, to kind of preserve. Um, what is the thing generally because those cotyledons are lows, the first, basically their type of primary leaf, um, those dormant buds down there are generally protected because they're down closer to the, to the, to the soil surface than, than plants that have them up and kind of exposed. Uh, so yeah, so the basal portion, like you say, Pete, is like the, the point, well, I mean, a couple of things happening. You know, you wanna have light fires going through uh, but and and so that's one of the things you don't want to get any fire too high because you can burn everything up in the woods with a real hot fire um so so the, let me craft this into a, a short and sweet so lower the better and the quicker the fire coming through uh the better okay. i don't even know if i and, got off totally on that question well so i think so the and i maybe i'm had steered it too much but it's it's important to retain that root collar that's yeah. that's that's the intersection of the stem and the root mm -hmm, and right. the picture that you showed and on the one or two occasions when i've dug up an oak seedling there's it kind of is a kind of a dog leg on the on the stem so the root comes down yeah. into the ground it runs laterally for an inch or two and then it runs vertically again and so that that root collar is where you have the the capacity for resprouting is that correct yeah that's a good good answer yes okay and then there's so then the question would be how much more of the root i'm guessing below that uh is necessary and i don't know maybe the more the better is my reaction i don't, well, I don't know maybe, maybe it, oh right how much of that root right so, so if, you, if you yank that thing out of the ground or something and you tear off some of the root or something maybe that's the source of the question right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I have never replanted a big carrot thing like that. That'd be kind of cool to do now I'm thinking about it. But, uh, but because, you know, you well, you can do that with other species as well, like Paulonia. You can take root cuttings and stick those in the ground, but I don't, it's really not the same. So the more the better. Yeah. Any, like any time I'm going to transplant some plant here. So I always, when I'm transplanting plants, the more that root system I can get. The, the the better likelihood that thing's going to survive but i don't right. know any, if there's any kind of proportion yeah yeah do you recall the root collar diameter that's that's kind of the threshold between a well-established seedling and one that is still needs some more time well okay so we get back into the kind of the politics of oak regeneration you know it used to be when there was a guy named Ivan Sander, who was a principal of civil mm -hmm. cultures out in the Midwest. Right. And he did a lot of oak regeneration stuff. You know, Paul Johnson and some of those names out there. And, sure. Um, and he used to say, they used to say, well, a, 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 the, a successful oak seedling has a one inch diameter at breast height. And you can find right. that out there. And even, I mean, at some point in time, you know, the classification of seedling that's the maximum size, you know, of seedlings. Right. So, but so one inch is big. Now, more recently, we've seen like some diameters of like six tenths of an inch of the root collar and stuff like that. But honestly, um, there we don't have a whole lot. Of, personally, I'm just going to say this right now. We don't have a whole lot of evidence of 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 what it 
what is a good, what does it mean to be established? Like I said, that, that last part of the oak regeneration process, the establishment, it, possibly the most complex because you start adding in things like all these different factors that affect the plants themselves and kind of the politics of the management. You know, how much management do you put in? How much do you invest? Politics and economics, I should say. Economics, I'll say that. And, you know, how much do you invest in trying to keep those going? Uh, because there is a lot of competition. Uh, so, so you know, I don't, I don't have any definitive thing. I, I'm not here to, you know, give some kind of, you know, you know, best practices for oak regeneration because, it is like that one question came, it is a big call. You know, it's easier just to cut your force and let things come back. I hate to say, right. It, yeah, right. but, but, if, but, but if you are trying to get oak regeneration, it's an investment. Yeah. It's a big investment. Yeah. Very and in fact, in fact, we, one, one last point, we had sure. a speaker on our seminar series, Haley Parker, I think it was, who did research uh, up in Pennsylvania and they have like these like hundred acre explosures. And, and she's saying, well, and I was thinking, well, holy mackerel. And she saw, you know, looked at birds inside, birds outside kind of thing. And I was thinking, boy, if the people of Pennsylvania were smart, they'd keep those exclosures because that's a rare, a rare event to have such protected areas like that. I mean, yeah, it costs to maintain the fences, but hey, pretty cool, pretty cool resource. Anyway, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Dave. Great job. Thank you so much. You put clearly put a lot of effort and passion into this and, and all of the uh, people commenting thought, you know, you did a great job and we're very appreciative of that. So I want to thank you. I'm going to 